Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started so we have maximum time with our speaker today. I'm Hannah Riley Bowles um, from uh, co-director here at WAP, where we are dedicated to uh, supporting research related to promoting gender equity and to the distribution of uh, practice, evidence-based, practice-relevant um, research for that aim as well. And then the function of this seminar in there is to connect um, our community of scholars, but also um, leaders in practice and students um, launching their careers, to cutting-edge uh, researchers who are doing work on women's leadership advancement and gender public policy. So I'm delighted um, to see you all here today. We'll also be um, joined virtually. Are you presenting? Were we podcasting today? Yes. Okay, great. So we'll be also joined virtually at some other time and space by other people who um, download the seminar, which has, I think, now been downloaded up in the tens of thousands of times. Um, so I am ex very excited um, to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Professor Jessica Pan is from the National University of Singapore. She is also a research fellow at um, the Institute of Labor Economics in Germany. Um, and she, but she did her um, undergraduate and doctoral work at the University of Chicago, is that right? Um, and so she does, um, uh, we're gonna hear from her, she does a lot of work related to um, labor economics and the economics of education and particularly um, the gender dimensions of this. And today we're gonna hear about her work on the mommy effect. So please join me in welcome. Thanks very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here and um, tell you a bit more about this work. So it's um, it's a paper that's joined with uh, Ileana and Jenny, who are both at Princeton, and Amania, who's at Yale. It's um, kind of a you know, group of four women. Um, and I think some of uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is, you know, in some way also influenced by some of our own personal experiences. So both um, Ileana and I both had kids within the time frame of writing this paper. So <laughs> young kids. All right. So um, just by way of motivation, um, I'm going to start with, uh, so this paper is broadly motivated by a number of facts that I think many of you in this room are very familiar with. Um, and the first fact that is sort of motivated by is this idea that, you know, at least in some dimensions, particularly to do with human capital accumulation, women have made very rapid progress and that many things have actually exceeded men in some of these dimensions. Uh, specifically, as many of you in this room are well aware, uh, for decades in the U.S., at least since the 1990s, women are actually even more educated than men. And in many uh, de developed countries as well as some developing countries in the women are also exceeding men in terms of education. Uh, beyond that, um, at least for most of the developed world, women have also, also started to substantially delay childbirth, in, in large part because they anticipate longer careers. And what this implies is that they're also accumulating a lot more job experience as well. So even in terms of job, job experience, the gap has been uh, reducing tremendously. Now, what is perhaps a bit less unknown, right, and kind of a, more of a, um, an interesting new fact is that despite this very large gain in terms of human capital accumulation, um, gender gaps in the labor market continue to persist. Okay, so that in itself is not very surprising, but if you actually turn to the data and you start looking at trends in female labor force participation, especially in the US and UK, you actually find something really quite startling, which is that it has pretty much been told. Now, I think that in itself is actually very surprising, especially if you think about the fact that women are now, more than ever, prepared for very long careers in the labor market. Um, it, so the blue lines here, so this is for the US and the UK, and the reason I'm bringing in the UK a lot is that you'll see that quite a bit of this uh, research is gonna be based on British data, for reasons I'm gonna explain in detail later. It turns out that they have a, a lot of the questions that we're gonna need to conduct the kind of analysis that we would like to do. So wherever possible, we're gonna supplement this with US data as well, so you get kind of this uh, cross-country comparison. Now, there has been a lot of emphasis sort of talking about the decline in men's labor force participation over time, and you do see in these uh, figures. But I think what has gotten a bit less attention, but is very, very clear from the data, is that you know, starting in the 1980s has been this very, you know, sort of um, uh, striking rise in female labor force participation. But starting in you know the early 1990s, at least in the U.S., it's completely flattened out. And if anything, more recent data seems to, have suggest, to suggest that it's actually declining. Now, if you focus on um, women between the ages of 25 to 34, so in their prime childbearing um, years, these figures are actually even more pronounced. Now, in the UK, you kind of see a, a sort of more gradual increase, but 
it, it's very clear, at least from this series as well, that it seems to have slow. Which kind of brings, which brings us to, to our motivating question, which is why do women continue to invest in human capital uh, investment, so costly education, delayed motherhood, even though since about 1990, their labor force participation rates haven't actually increased. Now, I'm going to be offering you kind of one way to rationalize this potential puzzle, although I will be very clear to mention that there are a lot of other ways to rationalize this as well that doesn't rely on our proposed explanation, but this is just one potential explanation that I think hasn't received as much attention in the literature. So put differently, uh, another way of asking this question is why is it that women's progress in the labor market appears to have stalled or slowed, even though, if anything, you would imagine that their pre-market investments would predict otherwise? And our answer, and kind of um, where this talk is going to be headed, uh, in that I'm going to try and provide evidence to substantiate this claim, is that one potential uh, way to reconcile this puzzle is that perhaps women are underestimating the employment cost of motherhood. And I'm going to be a bit clear about what I mean by employment cost. But at the very least, what I hope that you'll walk away from the talk today is um, that, you, that you'll be convinced by the uh, data that if anything, women do appear to be systematically underestimating the employment effects of motherhood. So they don't actually see it coming at a point in time in which they're actually investing in all this women's capital. Just wondering about the um, economics mm -hmm. data, so I mean, just women across all college-educated uh, systems. Right, so, so actually if you cut this picture up um, across different socioeconomic classes, um, uh, you, you do actually see a very consistent picture. If anything, it's more pronounced. Um, um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very similar by education as well. And I'm, I'm going to be showing you a lot of the cuts also by some of these characteristics uh, that we would be interested in. Um, so essentially, um, one implication of this underestimation is that they are investing in education thinking it's actually easier to be a, a working mom than it uh, turns out to be, and they kind of assume that you know, um, they, they could have it all um, uh, much more easily. Um, so what, what do I mean? So I'm going to use this word employment cost, and I'm going to throw it around a lot. And so I think it's useful at the beginning of the talk to kind of just fix our minds a little bit on how um, at least we come into this project thinking about this idea of an employment cost. And as you'll see um, from, from this slide, the way we choose to define it is kind of really broad, and we're doing that kind of on purpose, right? So in some sense, we think about employment costs as any form of cost in the form of either monetary costs, psychic costs, or opportunity costs, that's required for women to raise their children in a manner that they feel is appropriate, while at the same time maintaining um, um, work outside the home. Okay. Now, some of these costs are going to be costs that you know we, we often contemplate when you're thinking about working outside the home. So these will be things like you know hiring a nanny, um, you know ensuring that you know the kid has a place in a good preschool. But I think beyond that, the subset of costs that we're thinking about are the ones that are perhaps even more material, um, in the sense that. You know, very often if you think about mother skill, if you think about stigma costs, these are also costs that factor in when a woman decides to work. Over and beyond um, hiring outside help or hiring a nanny, right? And so some of these costs you can imagine may be even larger than the direct costs that one might face. And these could be include things like, you know, missing your children while you're at work, thinking that you're missing out on their important going events. Uh, and beyond that also, this idea that if you're at work, you're kind of like not doing either thing very well, right? So you're at work, or you're not quite like putting in your best because you're worried about the kid at home. And when you're at home, you kind of you know, are worried that somehow you should be out there working, okay? So in some sense, when we think about employment costs, we kind of want to capture both of these dimensions as well. Okay, so um, just to give you a preview of um, the talk as well as some of the results, uh, what we'll be doing is that we're going to be providing some pieces of evidence to support this claim that women do not seem to anticipate the uh, employment effects of motherhood. Uh, we're going to start by documenting um, uh, something that has been somewhat documented in the literature as well, but we want to show that this is true. But this is um, in some way not going to be the main focus of the results, but uh, it's something that we need to show, which is that we're going to show that if you actually just track employment over a woman's life cycle, you do find a very large negative employment effects of motherhood. Um, that in some sense have this stepwise function. And I think that in itself is very telling because it's sort of saying that if anything, uh, women's employment changes seem to be causally related to the event of birth as opposed to potentially the other way around. So uh, in other words, what we're saying is that in the years before childbirth, women's employment is very stable at a very high level. The year of birth itself exhibits a very large drop. And one thing that's perhaps surprising from this analysis is that we find very little evidence of recovery in the medium to the long run. 
In other words, we can track women up to five years to 10 years after uh, the event of childbirth and we see very few recovery. And the event in itself is kind of a little bit surprising, but when we get there, we can um, chat about why, some of the reasons why that might be. Can I ask just a clarifying question? So you're saying more educated women experience smaller decline? They do. But then, how do we square that? So, so what what is happening at the socioeconomic levels? I mean, I thought there are also arguments that women who are relatively educated and well off right. have more potential to leave the workforce because they have household income. Right. And so, is this a, how do how do I think about that? I mean, there, it's a differential. So, the, the proportion of women who are not college educated will typically be single. There's a very hard, high proportion of them will be they will be leading single. Mm -hmm. Parent households, mm -hmm. and so are they going on social services? Is that is this a story of people going on social services? If, I'm just trying to understand like who is making the income for the family if it's if the it's more the educated. Working. Yeah, yeah. If it's not the mom working. Right. Yeah. So um, we're going to use this education result in a number of ways, as you'll we'll see in a second. But what we're arguing here is that they experience slightly smaller declines, but it's as a percentage actually it might not be necessarily smaller. So these are just uh, absolute uh, changes relative to the year before childbirth. But what we'll see here is that although that, ch that differential change for educated women is somewhat smaller, so in other words, education has a mildly protective effect. Actually, the main effect of childbirth is still very large in that group. Now, to answer your question, um, we don't look separately at whether or not, um, so you'll see in a, bit, in a bit that in order to do this analysis, you're going to need a lot of years before and after the birth. So we can't actually cut by, for example, if you're a single mom. But it turns out that when we dug a little bit deeper into this precise question of like, you know, who exactly is earning the income if like no one's working and mom decides to drop out, um, in many of the cases, even if they're single moms, actually there, there might be a father figure around, right? So it's not necessarily the case, or, or they could be living with, the, with their parents at home. So we don't look specifically at that subset. Yeah, of course, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Which we don't have the power, unfortunately. Yeah. And could, could undereducated women be underemployed to start? I mean, is that part of the reason why they would have less of a drop? So here we find that they have a pretty big drop, actually. It's okay. the educated women that have a smaller somewhat smaller drop. But you'll see, when I say somewhat smaller, one might be surprised that the, the drop's not actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that the education doesn't have, doesn't have even more of a protective effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So having documented this, yeah. Just I mean, maybe building on what Hannah said, um, <coughs> there's also Claudia Goldman's work, of course, saying that uh, leaving the workforce is much more costly highly educated women. Right. So the opportunity cost, I mean, I'm, I'm completely yeah, 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 that's on somebody yeah, has yeah, to yeah. survive. Um, but it's also not as costly again, even in great integration um, for, for less educated women. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting because I think in, 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 this, in this part, I mean, with the highly educated women, I mean, there are two potential you know, stories here, right? On the one hand, it could be actually more costly for them to leave, but here we focus on labor cost participation, so we don't actually bring in uh, earnings, right? Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, it could also be that you know, once they leave for a year or two, it's much easier for them to come back in. Now, what we see in these patterns actually for both groups, surprisingly enough, is actually very little evidence, at least in the short to medium run, five to 10 years out, that there is substantial coming back in. Now the 10 years and five years includes the child number two, child number three, so it's not clear necessarily that that's the time frame. But I think for public policy, the fact that women are not re-entering within a five or 10 year period, it isn't in itself uh, uh, quite a problem. So you won't be finding differential re-entering? Re -entering. Uh, we do not find differential sure. re-entering. We haven't, yeah. And we haven't also actually dug specifically very deep into that, but um, we'll move on a little bit more and I'll show you where education really comes in because there's a very interesting story in the background about anticipation. So while we find employment effects that are mediated by education and that education seems to help, in terms of anticipation it actually seems that college educated women are the most surprised. So you have um, uh, you, you have this sort of a, a difference there. Alright, so uh, in terms of um, unanticipation, we're going to present um, evidence on two fronts. We're going to first focus on the very short run, and then we're also going to look at underestimation in the long run. Now, looking at underestimation in the long run is important because if it's, if, if it's consistent with our hypothesis that this impacts human capital accumulation, then it has to be some sort of unanticipation in the long run as well when people are actually making these human capital uh, investment decisions. Now, in the short run, we're going to be looking at two main pieces of evidence to uh, show um, non-anticipation. The first is that consistent with this idea that women's beliefs actually update with new information with the arrival of a child, 
we find that when we look, instead of employment, but instead now we look at gender role attitudes, so these are reported attitudes towards the appropriate balance that you place on market work versus work at home. So these are the questions that some of you may be familiar with in the general social survey, for example, that you know, ask, you know, does family life suffer if a woman works? How much do you agree with that statement? Um, whether or not a man should be you know, uh, working if, a, if, if he can, sorry, whether a woman should be working if a husband can, can support her, that sorts of questions. You find that you also see this evidence of a step function in these reported attitudes. So in other words, for women, in the years before having a kid, there's, you know, the, the attitudes are pretty stable. Um, in the first couple of years of the birth of the first child, again, very discontinuously, you see a shift towards more conservative or more anti-work views. And again, these views persist um, up to five years that we can we can we can observe the data. Yes. So you talk a lot about I think socioeconomic status and education, but I'm really curious about the role that race plays, mm -hmm. especially given that expectations of motherhood differ by race. So for example, I think Amy Cuddy did some fun work showing that a good mother, if she's white, she stays at home, but a good mother, if they're black, works. So right. the idea that when you have a kid, your gender, your beliefs about gender roles are changing, and the stigma and the psychic burden is affected by mm -hmm. the children seems to like diverge for race. Right. So what I guess, who are these women when you say women as like a problem? Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna apologize straight up front here that like yeah, I think race is a really important and really interesting topic, but. Um, with this particular analysis, there's actually quite little we can do with that. Uh, again, for power issues, and secondly, also that most of this evidence, at least on attitudes, for example, actually come from the British survey. Where again, this idea and concept of race is quite different in that context. And so, you know, this is unfortunate that I had to use this, like, you know, lack of power kind of like. Um, uh, but uh, when we, you know, so so this is, you know, on average, uh, and unfortunately, we were not able to do any race cuts in this in this particular exercise. But I'm happy to chat more. White women. Well, there, at least in the U.S. samples, there are black women as well, but this is on average. So, you know, um, yeah, we were not able to do some sample cuts by, 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 by race. I would love to in the future, but it's just not, yeah, not in this exercise. Yes? Do you speak to the different maternity leave policies in each of the different places during the time of your sample? Yeah, so we, we'll talk about that in a bit. And in fact, I'm going to bring in a little bit of evidence also from uh, the Danish countries, so the Scandinavian countries, for example. And, and there, I think I'll, I'll comment on it very, very briefly. Um, by and large, though, my understanding, at least in the US, is that there hasn't really been much change um, in, in that policy, that, so there's not much to say. In the UK, the way you should think about it is that it's very sim similar to the US. So um, in, in that, it, it doesn't have as much childcare provision. So it's a bit better than the US, but not by much. Okay. Um, so. So that's the first piece of evidence on, uh, on, on uh, um, lack of anticipation. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to use sort of more direct evidence. And here, there, uh, in the PSID, there's a really neat question asking women directly about whether or not they anticipate parenthood being harder than it would be. And there, again, you find this very interesting education gradient where women are more likely to report, educated women are more likely to report that parenthood's harder than they thought it would be. Um, now, moving on to, a, um, underestimation in the long run, we're going to be turning to these uh, much longer term um, expectation surveys where cohorts <coughs> of women um, in, uh, who are high school seniors were actually asked very consistently since the 1980s of the <coughs> likelihood that they thought that they were going to be homemakers. Okay. And then one thing that you see that's quite interesting is that at least in the past, uh, where you can actually connect some of these types of questions to earlier surveys that ask similar questions that Claudia Golden has done, you would see that actually in the past, past women actually seem to hugely underestimate their future labor supply. So more of them were saying that they would expect to be working from home than they actually were if you actually connect them to their actual synthetic cells 20 years later. So what we do here in this exercise is that we look at what high school seniors say in a particular year, for example, 1980. And then when they are actually age 30, which is what the survey refers to, we look, for example, in the CPS or the NLSY, exactly what they were doing, and we compare to see if there's evidence of systematic uh, overestimation. And there we do find, for example, this reversal in that in the past, they used to be underestimating the official labor supply, but today more often than not, and in fact, in an increasing manner, large groups of them are saying that they don't expect at all to be homemakers, but in fact, a good 20% of them eventually do. Now, you might wonder whether this is because of fertility considerations, and here we find actually that, in fact, um, women expect, at least more, recent cohorts of women expect to have lots of kids. They have, so if anything, they're overestimating their fertility. 
uh, while they are uh, uh, overestimating the future labor supplies. Okay. All right, so um, then this brings us sort of to the final part of our paper, which is to um, ask the question why it, you know, if we agree that it seems like they are underestimating the employment effects of motherhood, why are they doing so? So in the paper, uh, we provide a very simple theoretical framework that yields some of these empirical results, including this um, distinction by education, this idea that educated women are actually the most surprised. Um, so given the you know, sort of the, um, uh, time considerations, I'm not, not going to be uh, going in depth um, um, with the theoretical framework, but one of the key pieces here is that in order for there to be uh, under, uh, under unanticipation uh, across generations, it would actually require a situation in which the cost of motherhood has systematically risen over time, specifically in a way that people cannot easily predict based on past trends. And so here, uh, the evidence that we provide <coughs> is a little bit more speculative and it's going to draw a little bit more on a collage of evidence provided by different groups of people. But here we also show that consistent with rising employment costs of motherhood on different series, so for example, breastfeeding rates, cost of childcare, time spent with children, you do see not just evidence of these costs rising over time, but that some of these um, uh, trends actually exhibit U-shapes. So for periods of time, they appear to have been declining, and more recently actually appear to have been increasing. Again, providing another reason why women might find it actually not so easy to predict what the trends might be. Okay. So, um, at least in this audience, I don't think I need to spend much time on a slide about why we care about some of these, uh, these findings. As many of you know, women are the most elastic part of labor supply, and in many countries where one is grappling with kind of you know, low fertility and stuff, you might actually anticipate that trying to, um, um, to, to get more women to work would be a good thing. Um, the other thing is that, at least from, from an economist perspective, and again, you know, when I make this statement in sort of a more interdisciplinary crowd, it's, 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 it's kind of bizarre, but many of our economic models, especially on dynamic labor supply and fertility, actually start with the assumption that you know, people rationally understand what all the costs are, they can perfectly forecast what future labor supply is gonna be like. And so in that sense, actually just showing this basic result that women don't seem to anticipate the employment effects of motherhood has implications for how we model uh, labor supply behavior. Uh, and beyond that, you know, we can imagine that there are potentially large macroeconomic gains from um, increasing female labor supply and wage convergence, even beyond sort of uh, equity considerations. All right, so this paper is um, broadly related to lots of strands of, of work. Um, there are more recently a huge surge in um, papers looking at event study investigations of uh, motherhood and labor supply. And um, interestingly enough, consistently, I think all these papers across different cross-country contexts seem to find very similar results. So that's also very reassuring and depressing. <laughs> um, this is related very much to um, recent work by um, uh, some co-authors as well as myself and Claudia Golden um, that look at the role of changing as well as unchanging gender role of norms. We provide here, in some sense, a life cycle perspective on this. Um, and it's also related to a much smaller literature, actually mostly in sociology, that has actually looked at the role of parents <coughs> and gender norms. But here we're kind of going to be linking the two. All right, so um, that's the overview. Okay, so um, just to give you a sense of what the data is, so we're going to be using two main sources of data. We're going to be using the UK data, and this is a British Household Panel Survey. For those of you who are not familiar with this data set, it's an extremely rich data set. Uh, similar in structure, structure, for example, to the PSID, but what's really neat about the survey is that in addition to asking things like employment c c consistently over 18 waves, it also asks very consistently questions on gender role attitudes, which is something that we're going to do. So here, one of the basic requirements is that we're going to want to have these attitudes before, in the years before the child is born, as well as in the years after. It's actually not so easy to find a US data set that has that. The NLSY kind of has that to some extent, and we're going to be using it, but more as a robustness check, because it's only asked four times over that period. The other thing that the uh, BHPS is really good for is that it also asks you about employment expectations in the very short run. So it asks women who have a job, for example, do you expect to be working next year? And again, that's sort of very neat. They ask it with a lot of regularity and frequency, and it's something else that we're going to be using. So, it, so this sample, it's, it's not small. It, it begins with a sample of about 5,000 households. But you'll see that once we impose our sample restrictions, we're going to be down to a much, much smaller subset, which is going to limit a little bit some of the other kinds of uh, uh, cuts that you might have wanted to see. 
Okay, so most of our analysis is going to be using an event study design. So essentially, it's just a fancy word for saying that we're going to be looking at how uh, the event, um, how the outcome changes as a function of the event. So the years before and after childbirth, so childbirth is our event. Um, so because most of our analysis uses this design, we're going to be um, focusing on a sample where that includes only people, women who have uh, one, one uh, at least one child within that period. Um, so in, in this particular setup, everyone identifies the main regression. Now, in some robustness checks, we're also going to include as a control group women who never had kids in this period, as well as women who may have had kids uh, even before uh, the start of this period, oh, as well as women who never had kids. Uh, it turns out the results are very robust to whether or not we include them. Uh, in the US data, uh, we, we're going to make a few sampling restrictions to avoid very severely imbalanced event studies, so in other words, seeing too many observations before or after the event. So here are some summary statistics. Um, in, again, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into big detail on this, but I think the only thing to really note is that um, for the BHPS and the PSID, which are the two data sets that you'll be seeing the employment effects on, uh, most of these individuals, even the youngest ones, are currently in their 40s. Okay? So we're not talking about the most recent group of women here. So it's, it's in, in that sense, it's actually kind of like um, a slightly older group. I, I have to ask a question which I'm sure you have been asked many times before, and that this is not an exogenous shock. I'll so, show you. Right, you okay. Okay. So that's a, so one of the reasons why um, I think most people haven't quite looked at event studies as much, and my, my hypothesis for why it's more it, there's a recent surge in it is exactly this concern about exhaustion. So every time you think about how to study this 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 effect of mother, you think, oh, I need an instrument, and it's really hard to find an instrument. But I'll, hopefully, when I show you the event study pictures, it's very compelling that it seems to be the case that um, it's, it's an exhaustion shock. So, um, so this is the only slide with equations, and here um, this is going to be the regression specification we're going to run. The y here is the outcome, so it could be either employment or it could be uh, general attitudes. <coughs> um, here we're going to be, I'm, I'm going to be showing you for, from now on actually just graphs that plot this beta tau coefficient. And what this beta tau coefficient here is our event study coefficient, which tells you what the outcome is uh, in the years before and after childbirth. So tau here takes on values from minus five, so up to five years before birth to tau max, so tau max would be between 5 or 10. In some data sets like the BHPS, we go up to 5 years out. Uh, in some data sets it's like the US, once we go up to 10 years out, so tau max would be 10. So we, we basically we plotting the coefficients in the 5 years before and up to 10 years after um, the event of childbirth. In all the specifications, we're going to be controlling for year fixed effects. We're going to be controlling for age fixed effects, and these are important because we're looking over a pretty long range of time, so age effects could be such a labor force participation, for example, could be changing over the life cycle, that takes that up. And in these specifications, we can also control for individual fixed effects because these are longitudinal dynamics. So essentially, I'll, I'm just going to be showing you graphs that uh, plot the beta tau coefficients. Do you have any way for accounting, of accounting for partner income and how partner income changes over that time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that also kind of speaks to your point about not only is it not exogenous like the person themselves, but right. also like if a partner earning or yeah. in some cases there might not be a partner. Right. So, so this is going to be a potentially tricky question. We've <coughs> had some cuts by uh, partner's income pre-birth. Uh, one thing that is going to be especially tricky to do is because not all of these people are married in the years before. In fact, 40% of them are actually not married before and then eventually they get married over the life cycle, but it also makes it hard to define what a partner is and whether or not the partner itself is endogenous. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna not talk about that question for a bit, but when when it comes up and it's relevant, uh, we'll bring it back in. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the, the other thing is that in the pictures I'm gonna show you, we're also gonna report one coefficient at the top, and this essentially is going to be the uh, difference in difference coefficient, which collapses all of the event time study dummies into one before and after birth. Okay. So that's gonna be the the difference in difference coefficient. Yeah. <coughs> how we can the mother, the mother, the mother, the name, I mean, just the, the family and the mother, that in the society, in the nation, in the world now, mothers are suffering so much, and how can we uh, 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 decrease the suffering of the How can we improve the mother and the children's life and family in general? So that is very important for me. So I mean, that, that's a really broad question that I, I'm not sure we'll, we'll get to. I mean, well, we're going to have some implications of this result, so I think uh, at the end of it, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to uh, 
sort of uh, answer that question, you know, we can discuss it in the conclusion. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to be first showing you um, events and study graphs so with uh, regards to employment. And so we're going to look at this in general uh, for the whole uh, sample and then um, uh, it, it, later on we're going to basically cut this up by dimensions related to our, our hypothesis such as education, uh, pre-baby expectations and attitudes as well as experiences of your own mother. We've done a, a bunch of other cuts as well, so if a particular cut um, uh, it comes to your mind that uh, isn't reported here, I'm happy to also just uh, uh, tell you if we've done it. So essentially this is the uh, event study um, plot for employment using the UK data. We, uh, I'll show you in the next slide the pictures for the US uh, data. Now, so this is related to Iris's point about exogeneity, right? So if we were worried, for example, that employment was declining for women who were intending to have children, what you would expect to see there in some sense is some evidence of a pre-trend. So in the five years leading up to a child, you would expect that women's employment would have already be declining in anticipation of having a child. <coughs> now what you see in this figure is that, at least in the UK, women's employment the years before having a kid is extremely flat and at very high levels. So we've um, renormalized this graph such that the coefficient at tau equals to minus one is um, exactly the raw mean of employment um, um, in the pre-baby sample, and that's at about 87%. So in the years prior to childbirth, employment is very high at that level. Now, the year of birth of the child is associated in itself with a 40 percentage point decline in the likelihood of employment. Now, again, this is not in raw levels, right? Because here, remember, we control for some of these fixed effects. So this is relative to a no baby counterfactual. Now, the year after birth, so all this is just something I should mention is relative to tau equals minus one. So that's, 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 that's fixed. Now the year after birth, uh, women recover a little bit by about five percentage points, but after that you see again very little evidence of recovery after five years old. Um, full-time and part-time employment? Yeah, so this is just uh, work last week. So it's a very simple binary question, uh, were you at work last week? Uh, we've also looked at labor force participation as well as um, uh, part-time, full-time, and you, you see similar trends for hours worked as well. Now, you might be curious how this looks for, like in the US, and so here we've done this for three different data sets. That both of the NLSYs as well as the PSID. Now they st start from slightly different levels, um, partly because um, women are at different ages at the start of the sample. But again, I think all of them have this very, very sort of um, stepwise uh, form, right? Where in the years before motherhood, again, very stable, pretty high levels of female labor force participation. The year of birth itself, a huge drop down. And again, maybe surprisingly, very little evidence of recovery up to 10 years after. Um, now, we have done this separately by the you know, first birth and second birth, and you'll find that most of the effects are realized with the first birth. There's a bit more negative effect with the second birth, but not as much as the first birth. Yes, I think my question is maybe related, and I just don't have the statistical intuition. Is some of this that actually after the first birth in those first five years, people are having second children, and that's dropping at 40%, but some people are going back to work? It's yeah, so, um, so in general, from what we found is that it's, it's dropping once you have a first birth. The second birth drops it slightly more by about a quarter of the size of the first birth. We didn't have enough power to look at the third and fourth births, but I think the way I would think about 10 years out is essentially that most women are probably having child number two at uh, age three and four. Now, by the time, even if you don't have kid, child number three, 10 years out essentially is when your, kid, your, your youngest kid's just out in preschool. Right, so in a sense, one would uh, you know you would like to actually extend this even further, you know, 15 years out, 20 years out, and I think for some of these cohorts we might be able to, but you, you know you can imagine this is a very demanding exercise. But I think our biggest takeaway from this is that I think very often you think that women after about five or six years out should be going back to the labor market, and actually we really don't see them doing that. And having 10 years out, I mean, whether you're high skill or low skill, it is 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 a long time out. Yeah. So uh, that that's a great question. Just related to that, is there data? That's sort of retrospective where women say, I was out of the labor force, because you know, just in my own experience among friends and family, it can be two years, it can be 15 years. Right. Is there sort of descriptive data of how long people say they were out of the labor force <coughs> after a child? Right, so I, I think that's really interesting. So one of the things that we draw a bit uh, on, and actually, um, it, so that there's, this, that there's a set of uh, these uh, qualitative surveys, actually from, that's now a book called the uh, Ambition Interviews that focus on a group of, you know, sort of very selected, highly educated women that very much discuss um, this idea about whether women anticipate dropping out, and when they do drop out, how long they drop out for. And I think many of these things, I mean, there, there are obviously people coming in and out, but on average, at least, you do see a, a huge supply. So moving on, um, so we do a number of checks, and in, in general, um, 
um, we find that it's, it's very robust. Interestingly enough, we find, you know, as you might expect, very little effect of uh, bats on the labor supply. Uh, I, uh, we're not going to focus much on men, but in general, the biggest takeaway is that there's just not, not much effect on them in, in most dimensions, so uh, that's that. Um, so, um, uh, and again, with the effect of the second child, um, it does have an additional negative effect, but it's, it's somewhat smaller than the first the first group. Okay. Now, moving on to heterogeneity, and this is, uh, I think, uh, quite interesting, is that here we're going to look at heterogeneity based on characteristics that are closely related to our hypothesis. So we're going to be considering a number of factors that the literature in general has emphasized should protect women against the employment effects of motherhood. So this is going to be things like whether you have yourself a college degree, whether you have yourself a working mom. In addition, we're going to have access, at least in the BHPS, to two of these really neat questions about their expectations about the employment costs of motherhood. So for example, we can cut about whether or not they were very progressive in their gender views right at the beginning. And we can also use this question at least uh, in uh, a couple of these data sets, with whether at age 18, you actually anticipate working in your 30s. And we, we might expect, for example, that women who do expect to work in their 30s or report doing so uh, would imagine that they would have a uh, lower employment cost. Do you have any information on the partner's uh, gender views? Yeah, so we have some information on gender views, but as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the tricky parts here is that ideally we'll be using the gender views of the um, before the birth, and there actually a, a quite a large number of them are unpartnered, so we're not actually able to use that. Now, on the other hand, we've done some cuts, for example, by spousal education, and there, or partner education, and because that's kind of a characteristic that's more unchanging, and there again, we find actually very little heterogeneity um, by, by that particular cut. Um, now, in general, we find very little differential effects for gender or first child, whether or not you were married before your first child, your age at first birth, and Surprisingly enough, whether or not you were in a so-called family-friendly occupation before. By the way, I find the age at first birth really interesting. Yeah. There's this uh, work by David Elwood that I also thought about when I um, asked about uh, end uh, endogeneity, mm -hmm. and that kind of suggests that um, college-educated women delay the birth of the first child quite a bit. Right. Um, but you're just saying it doesn't matter whether you delay or not. So it, it, it doesn't matter where you, so we do find women are delaying, but conditional on delaying, uh, it doesn't seem like delaying yeah. in itself actually has Not a huge it. effect on, yeah. on yeah. the size of the, uh, of, yeah. of the, of the decline. Yeah. Um, it's surprising, I mean, we kind of expected to find maybe more heterogeneity than what we found, and maybe that's kind of one of the takeaways here. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. 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 So by college graduate, so in fact, of all the dimensions that we look at, so this is one that it does seem like it has a, a, a malprotective effect. So across the two groups, the differences are statistically significant. So the way we array these, these are basically, you know, for each of the data sets that we have, we did a cut. We don't do the whole event study because that's just going to take up too much space, but essentially we report the uh, coefficients. Um, now, one thing to note though with college uh, graduates is that even though it does have a malprotective effect, even the main effects for college graduates itself, I mean, it's large. It's a 20 percentage point decline on average across the four data sets. Now, whether or not your own mother worked, some of the some previous studies have actually found that um, this has some differential effects. We don't find any in this case. One thing to note, though, is that you have, we, we don't have very good controls for the reasons why mom worked. So it could be conflating, for example, working due to necessity versus working because she herself is progressive. And so maybe that's why we don't find much, but we don't. Um, now, poor work attitudes is interesting. Uh, as you might expect, at least in two of the data sets, uh, being more liberal pre-baby yourself actually does have a protective effect, right? Um, and if you say that you plan to work, again, your employment effects tend to be smaller. But even in all these cases, the uh, main effects are, are, are large. Yeah. So uh, the poor work attitudes are measured before. before. Uh, so would that tell us the story of um, this is not necessarily a woman that are updating the attitudes toward work and having different choices, but it's mostly companies or firms that, you know, through statistical discrimination or other mechanisms right. are actually affecting yeah. the so real cost. I think it's really hard to tell because what, the reason why we do this heterogeneity is that, so what, one thing you might be concerned about with our results is that, you know, next I'm going to show you these uh, results on gender roll attitudes, right? And, you know, we're going to say, oh, but it's not very surprising because women are just going to update based on the so I start working and therefore I just become more conservative because that's kind of how I reconcile within myself that, that you know, um, um, it, it's okay to do that. But one thing that we find that, does, that speaks against that particular hypothesis and it's more in this idea of updating is that specifically on these cuts, okay, so I'm kind of hoping that you'll remember what these cuts are so we're leaving them on the screen for a bit longer, <laughs> is that if anything, everything moves in the opposite direction. 
Okay, so a, co a simple cognitive dissonance story would predict that how I update is going to move exactly in this direction. In fact, we find everything moving in the opposite direction. So while college graduation has a protective effect on employment, if anything, where you'll find is that this group of women are the ones that are most surprised by the effects of childbirth. In the same way, you know, own mother, we don't find much effects, but if anything, those with the own mother who work actually are, again, the most surprised. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard because we're cutting exactly on the variable of interest, but it turns out that the entire shift is actually among women who themselves started to be more liberal. They are the ones that has, have the biggest conservative shift. And again, among this group, you, you see the biggest reversal um, that's opposite from this. Okay, so that speaks against a sort of simple cognitive dissonance. Now, um, we haven't talked about employers yet, but I think let's move a bit towards the end because it's one of the potential costs. So okay, so um, this is a summary of the employment effects. Um, the only one thing I want to mention is that these employment effects are actually very consistent with what um, a recent study by Cleveland uh, finds, and there they use really rich administrative Danish data. And they also find, perhaps surprisingly, this stepwise function despite the very sort of liberal paternity policies. So again, very depressing. Um, that being said, the effect size that they find is a bit different. In fact, it tends to be about half the size or a third the size of what we find. So it could very well be the case that these uh, policies do have some effect, but mostly in terms of uh, um, the size of the employment effect. But these are very consistently measured, very sharp declines as well. Okay. So moving on to anticipation, uh, we'll look at gender role attitudes. So the basic idea here again is that if women don't fully anticipate the employment costs, we will expect them to be updating their beliefs. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, specifically these questions related to gender role attitudes. So these are the list of six questions that we use. So these are questions like family life suffers if a woman works full time. Um, a woman and family is, um, is happier if she works. A husband and wife should both contribute income. Husbands should work, wives should stay at home. So all of these are subjective questions. Uh, respondents answer them on a scale of one to five. Um, wherever <laughs> relevant, we reverse them in, in such a way such that a higher number implies a more liberal or more pro-work attitude. So I'm going to be showing you uh, results where we just aggregate the six measures into a single index. Uh, but we've also done this separately for each of the components. And for five of the six components, you'll see similar effects. The only one where we see kind of more sort of null, null results is actually the first one. Uh, preschool, child suffers in the mother works. Uh, we can speculate for a long time why that's the case. Uh, we don't actually know for a fact, but it seems to be the only question in the list of six that actually refers directly to uh, an age group of a child. So maybe that's that's. One. Um, so in general, you'll see that women tend to be slightly more um, liberal than men in answering these questions, but not by a huge amount. Um, the other thing to note also is that here um, we have about six hundred of the seven hundred observations, and we observe. Um, about three times before um, the birth of a child, their general attitudes, and we observe about two to three times after. You'll notice that this is going to be less than what we have for employment because these questions were asked every other day. So, yes? Can you tell us please how to do uh, women and children's life in any way? Uh, because women and children are suffering in both many nations, but the is in our community, and also how to improve the family. I'm not sure if I'll have any specific prescriptions about how to improve uh, more generally, but I think we're focusing on kind of the very narrow question about when women actually anticipating um, um, working, and so um, yeah, so I'm not sure if we'll have specific. Uh, what was the topic anyway? I'm sorry. The topic of your speech. What was it? Um, it was about the mommy effect, about whether or not women anticipate um, the employment effects of childbirth. All right, so this um, uh, uh, figure here presents an event, the event study analysis of general attitudes. So instead of the employment outcome now, we just switched it with the uh, index of gender norms. And here what you observe again is that in the years before the birth of the first child, there's again very little evidence of, uh, of pre-trends. Right? So it's kind of flat, maybe if you squint, there's a bit of a decline. Um, now, for the year of birth of the first child, women become slightly more conservative. Um, and the year after, uh, become uh, uh, even more conservative, and that seems to persist up to five years out. Um, in terms of magnitude, it's about a quarter of a percent deviation in terms of a shift towards the more conservative direction. And uh, the point 0.9 actually is kind of <coughs> close to the male-female difference in uh, conservative attitudes. Okay. So again, I think so this is consistent with the idea that you know, in the years before the birth of the first child, 
um, women's attitudes are quite stable, and then they, they, they experience some sort of updating of the leaves um, uh, with the event of childbirth. Uh, again, I think you know, we don't make sort of a strong claim for exogeneity per se, but the fact that there are no evidence of pre-trend suggests that these changes um, are sort of post-childbirth <coughs> rather than pre-childbirth. Now with men, you actually do find slight effects, uh, but they're about a quarter of the size of that for women, at least in the BHPS, and they're never statistically significant. Now, we, um, we're going to try and do this exercise also for the NLSY, just because it's useful to have a uh, counterpart to compare. But one thing to note is that um, although the NLSY is a very long series, this question was only asked four times. So the number of people who actually identified each event time coefficient is going to be quite small. But in any case, we're going to uh, do this. And reassuringly enough, at least standard error bars are very large, but actually you find quite similar effects. Now here, you do find some evidence of a pre-trend. But we've actually done some of these robustness where we control for individual person-specific time trends and stuff like that. And actually, it doesn't seem to really matter. But again, I'll say take this with a bit more of a pinch of salt because um, you know, when we started this project, actually, we chose not to use NLSY. But we kind of <coughs> came around, you know, full circle because uh, we thought it would be useful to compare. All right. Now, moving on to, um, oh, one thing I should mention is that you might be wondering whether this shift in general attitudes is kind of a larger shift towards cultural conservatism on some other measure. And here with the BHPS as well as the NLSY, I mean, you, can, you have other questions that's not related to this idea of men and women's work. And there we've done the same exercise, and at least on questions about cohabitation, homosexual relationships, and divorce, we don't actually find uh, similar changes in terms of, uh, of, of shifts. Okay. Now, so we're going to look at heterogeneity. Um, so um, as you recall, for, uh, the patterns for employment, we're going to be comparing it with the um, patterns for general attitudes. And, and this is what we find. So in general, you'll see here that, um, again, the differences for college, uh, edu college graduates are significant, and they actually move in the opposite direction. So the largest shifts are actually among women with a college degree, relative to women without a college degree. Um, having an own mother work also seems to result in much greater surprise. Um, women who plan to work in this group only use using the NLSY, they too also tend to have the largest surprise as well. Now, in fact, if you look among um, women who didn't say that they plan to work, actually there was kind of no effect there. Um, now, pro work attitudes is a tricky one again because this is exactly the dependent variable that we're using. But here, you do find that most of the shift is again concentrated among women who used to be more liberal to begin with. Again, sort of uh, uh, this idea of surprise. Now, um, so I think we, we spoke about this. So um, I think one way of thinking about this uh, is is that it doesn't seem like these shifts are purely an artifact of cognitive disciplines. All right. Now, moving on to kind of a bit more direct evidence, uh, we're going to be using uh, the PSID, and there they have this really neat retrospective question, which is you know on a scale of one to five. Um, how would you respond to a statement like, being a parent is harder than I thought it would be? Now, with any of these subjective questions, you always have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. And here, I think we're going to be looking at two dimensions. One is a comparison between men and women. And beyond that, also to see whether or not if our hypothesis about educated women being more surprised um, holds, holds water, you might actually expect to see that um, also true here. So um, this is this is the uh, this table shows the regression results. So the outcome here is just a binary variable. We coded people who responded fours and fives on this question as being people who anticipated parenthood being harder than expected. Uh, we run separate models for men and women, and we are interested in looking at whether you see the education gradient. Now, one thing too that's interesting is that if you just look at the mean of the dependent variable across <laughs> gender, there are huge differences, right? Both, uh, a fraction in both groups expect that parenthood is going to be harder, but you know, more women than men. Yeah. And secondly, um, the men have no education gradient. So whether or not you're highly educated or not makes no difference in terms of your response to this question. But for women, call it, you know, it appears to be the case that significantly about 12 percentage points of women with a college education systematically say it's harder than they it, than it would otherwise have. All right, now the, another question that we could use, and here um, there's going to be a little bit of sample selection issue, but I'm going to explain it. But I think it's also very telling is that the BHPS actually asks uh, questions that, that pertain to very short run expectations. Okay, so this is literally that it, it, in a particular survey year, if you had a job, you're going to be asked, do you expect to give up paid work over the next 12 months? And then you give a binary answer yes or no. What we can do in the BHPS, because it's longitudinal, we can always look next wave to see if, in fact, your prediction came true. Now, as you would expect, men are 
spot on. You know, every year they're going to say, yes, I'm going to be working, and in fact, they're working. And what I'm going to show you here is that women in the years before childbirth are also spot on. You know, if you ask them in the years before childbirth, do you expect to be working 12, uh, 12 months from now? They're going to be saying yes, and it's actually going to be true. But in fact, they become systematically kind of uh, less likely to be accurate in the years after childbirth. So this is the event study figure where um, the black dots um, show the outcome in terms of whether or not they actually gave up paid work. And here, what we see is what mirrors the previous figures, where in fact there is an increase, about 17 percentage points in the likelihood of giving up paid work. But in fact, only about half of these departures are actually predicted 12 months before. Okay, so the predictions are the pink dots. And in fact, there you see a shortfall. And this shortfall is about half of the main effect implying that only about half of these departures are predicted, even in a very short run, 12 months before. Now, again, you have to take these results a little bit with a pinch of salt, because ideally, we would actually have had information on women who were out of the labor force being asked the question, are you likely to return? And we don't. Right? So these effects, in some sense, are even more, perhaps, surprising, because it's saying that even among women who remain in the labor force, they are still increasingly inaccurate. Okay, so it's conditioned on a subsample of women who still have jobs at that point in time. Okay? Now, one way that you could think about why this is happening could be you know, that you don't decide immediately that you want to quit, but you know, in fact, you find that it becomes actually harder and harder. But it's still a little bit of a puzzle because you would imagine that after five years old, those women are actually very selected and uh, more attached. Okay? But that's uh, one of the limitations. OK, now turning to more long-run evidence. So, one aspect that's very important to our story is that not only do women not anticipate in a very short run, but in a much longer term, there is also this lack of anticipation, especially at the points in which they are making their human capital um, decisions. Yes. Can I just ask a question about <coughs> trying to contextualize the short run effects a little bit, thinking about the expectation formation right. process for other mm -hmm. kind of job shock. So if somebody's trying to guess the probability that they're going to quit their job, yeah. now, is this kind of some, like, is there a lot of noise in all this? Like, do people make a lot of mistakes in other contexts, or is there something unique about this decision? Like, I'm trying right. to. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I think um, we were asked this also previously, and I think we tried to go back to the survey to look at other forms of job loss. And I think, unfortunately, we we're not able to find something that really quite gets at that. But I think your question is more broadly about, you know, are people just in general bad at forecasting things that, you know, happen with some particular regularity? Or is this something really quite specific about, um, this group of women, um, who, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I can't answer that, but I think if we do come across a question that kind of speaks more directly at you know probability of job loss in the medium or the longer term, I think that would be that would be useful. Yeah. Um, incredibly interesting. One of my questions is we're basically looking at this within the context of how the women predicted, right. presuming that the women had full agency in the decision of whether or not they left work. Yeah. And I know to Clementine's question, you're, we're going to talk a bit more about mm -hmm. the interaction with employers. Right. But it may not be that women overestimated how hard work was mm -hmm. with a child or how hard rearing children was, but underestimated employer backlash of motherhood or um, yeah. lack of ability to continue to be seen as full employees right. and therefore didn't really have mm -hmm. such full agency. And then, less from the research side, but on a personal note, right. being a very typical woman who delayed um, childbirth, I didn't underestimate how hard raising children would be. I underestimated how joyful it would be. So it would never have <laughs> dawned on me that I would feel the same tug um, to be with my kids, having always found work so joyful. But it didn't sort of occur to me. And also, like having a working mother might not have any way made a, a woman identify with the joy that her mother right. had. So, so the joy could be an employment is. cost as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like having double <laughs> negative. <laughs> but you see, the joy in itself is a cost because, you know, there's a work. I'm looking at all these cute baby pictures, and I could really be at home spending time with the kids. So the joy in itself, so it, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's an odd a bit of framing, right? But in some sense, if you think about, so we're not making any normative statement about whether it's right or wrong to do this sort of thing, sure. right? Because in fact, you know, it, could, it all could be better if mom stays at home and something. Anything could be but the yes. fact that one doesn't anticipate the fact that children could bring so much joy yeah. in itself um, 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 yeah, uh, could be part of our important causes. But that being said, you might be a bit unusual because uh, there's a nice study by one of my advisors uh, that looks actually at three groups of women. Women with only a career, 
women with only a family and women with a career and family. And guess which group she finds is the most unhappy? Career and family. Yeah. So the women with a career and family systematically on questions related to life satisfaction, questions related to emotional well-being, actually report being more tired, more stressed, more unhappy. I don't remember the author at the moment, but I like to focus on the study that showed women who had both were healthier. Oh, okay. That was my, that's my favorite. One. <laughs> that's true. That's <laughs> There's something that they don't have time to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> in the short run, I'll let you know. <laughs> so yeah, so 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 here we're going to be looking at basically high school seniors. We're going to be looking at what they expect, and then we're going to match it with uh, what they actually experience. Um, now again, you know, with these surveys, um, th th there are going to be issues, right? Because here they are not asked probabilistically what they're likely to do. They're going to be asking in a very binary fashion, do you expect to be a homemaker and, you know, versus not one, or selecting from a group of like 15 different occupations. Um, now, what you find, so there's a lot going on in this picture, but I just want you to focus on this, um, the hollow line, okay? And so the hollow lines, and so these are basically expectations. So you'll see that over this period, so this is the year the respondent turned 18, uh, so these are high school senior cohorts from 1970 to 2014. Essentially, women used to think, with, with, in a large majority of them, used to think that they would be homemakers. But that number, at least in recent times, is literally like 2%. Okay? Now, you might be asking yourself at this point, like you know, in these surveys, who are these people who are actually going to respond, I'm going to be a homemaker? And that's a totally legitimate question. But I think what is interesting here is that if you compare this with actual rates of homemaking, and that's the green line here, uh, these are at different ages, hence the slight shift. Um, in general, they mirror each other very closely, but during a period of time in which women's labor force participation really hasn't actually changed, women, uh, high school seniors, were actually becoming increasingly optimistic about the chance of not becoming a homemaker. And I think that's sort of the basic point here um, that seems to suggest that there is this lack of anticipation in the bottom line as well. Yes. Do you think there's a role for social desirability bias here, where yeah. the norms are changing and I'm reporting norms more than no, so I think that there could be that. I mean, I think the fact that, you know, um, the fact that they're kind of increasing over time seems to suggest, I mean, the fact that this is reversal uh, would require social desirability to be changing over that period of time, which could, could be precisely that story. So again, I think, you know, with this figure, um, when we first saw, saw it, we, we too did not you know, know exactly how to interpret this. But I think it does sort of speak in the same direction when taken together with the rest of the evidence that suggests that there could be some sort of anticipation. Um, now, with the fertility pictures, on the other hand, you actually find that these are the precise cohorts of women that actually do anticipate having two to three, three children. So it's not the case in which they're reporting these very low expectations of homemaking because they're thinking that they're going to have fewer kids. Um, so, um, so that's that. Uh, in terms of education expectations, they, that too you don't see such a dramatic uh, change as well. And I understand these are, we can go back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. These are different data sets, so maybe this is not a question you can answer, but it looks like this is dramatic difference. I mean, it's the red versus the green, as in something dramatic happened in that. Yeah. So one thing that's a but bit unfortunate. It's different data sets, right? So that's why we might not be able to directly. Yeah. Well, it's different data sets, but actually, so, so for example, this green line here and these two are actually different data sets, but they match up very closely together in terms of real life outcomes. So, th so this actually data set comes from the NLSY, where these are the expectations and these are the realizations. So this is the period of time in which women were hugely underestimating their labor supply. But there you see that actually in terms of actual uh, actual uh, realizations, it does track what we see in the CPS. Okay? So it seems, but you know, one thing that's unfortunate is that we're missing these crucial intermediate years where we have yet to find a survey that covers these two uh, pieces. So actually, this part here, Claudia Golden has shown. Um, yep. This part here and the crossover is uh, something where we don't actually see exactly when it crosses over. We know it happened during some of that period. But one thing, of course, we're a bit nervous about is that you know, the way in which these questions were asked were different. That's it. These two series are actually from the analysis why, just different quotes. Mm -hmm. So it's not something specific about the uh, monitoring the future survey versus the analysis why. No, no, I totally believe the data, the story, I'm just saying that that changed. It was like dramatic. Yeah, it's dramatic. And it makes you wonder what happened in the intervening yeah. period, yeah. to be honest. And, and I wish we had an answer. Yeah. In, in 1974 is when 
And I just looked at the name to make sure I'd get it right, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act passed in the United mm -hmm. States. So it was in 1974 that women began to have their own um, access to an economic life and were able to mm -hmm. have a credit card, um, would begin to be able to co-sign for a mortgage. So all of a sudden, women's economic gains began to attach to their own agency in the economic marketplace. And 1974. Way, yeah, that before that they did not. Right. I wonder if anyone has actually studied the effects of that law. That would be a really interesting question. <laughs> Perhaps you have. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you have, but so we don't have data on the patent on the right. So. <laughs> All right. So um, n now moving beyond just you know the, the, these patterns, I, I, I made a quick mention to that uh, ethnographic work of women high achieving women. So that's by uh, Shank and Wallace. Some of you may have actually seen they had a, uh, they had published us, uh, a bit of it in the Atlantic. Uh, these series of very in-depth interviews. And so I think, you know, we, we pulled out a few of the uh, uh, quotations from that because I think it sort of resonates well with the story that we were telling. So for example, um, within this example of high-achieving women, um, out of 43 of them, 34 had children, and you know, quite a, 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 a fair share of them had dropped out of the labor market. And I think, you know, some of these quotations are kind of informative. You know, I wasn't planning on staying at home with my child, but once he was born, I realized something had to give and I needed to figure out what. Um, at least in this sample, only two of the eleven mothers have dropped out, trying to do so before actual birth. Again, this is all retrospective, so in some sense, I think you know um, uh, we might actually have some access to some undergraduate students these days. But it'd be nice to do something more prospective. So, okay. So um, moving on quickly, I don't actually know how much time I have, so I'm oh, just going to um, keep going on. Top of the thing. hour, yeah. Oh, so one o'clock. Great. Okay, perfect. So. Um, so th which brings us to, I think, the natural question, what do women, uh, why do women underestimate the mommy effects, right? And so our preferred explanation is because the employment effects of motherhood may have risen, and specifically in a way that women could not predict based on past trends. Now, we're going to provide a collage of empirical evidence um, that seems to suggest that the employment cost of motherhood appears to have risen, at least since the 1990s, after what appears to have been decades of decline. Now, in general, um, many of you who are familiar with this literature, actually, there's a very large literature in macroeconomics that very much emphasizes the decline in the cost of motherhood, specifically as a key driver to understanding why female labor force participation rates have risen so quickly since the 1980s. Now, one might, want, might, might wonder if the same sort of explanations can also explain why is it that female labor force participation rates have actually been told. And one possibility is that perhaps many of these gains that were associated with huge increases in female labor force participations may have actually petered out or maybe even moved in an opposite direction. And I think this is really, this part of the talk is really a lot more suggestive and maybe I would say a call for more research in, in some of these explanations. So in particular, some of these, um, these drivers um, that people have studied include things like medical advances, reduced morbidity associated with childbirth, the diffusion of infant formula, allowing mothers to go back to work, for example. Uh, there's a very nice study by Greenwood and co-authors suggesting that electrification in itself liberated women from household chores. So the advent of the dishwasher, the microwaves, and in general, the, the declining cost of electricity basically allowed women to substitute many of these things that they would otherwise have to do themselves. Um, and there's also some work that looks at um, declining stigma costs for working mothers, the evolution of social norms, perhaps, for example, precipitated by the use of the pill uh, that may have contributed, to, again, to this rapid rise in female labor force participation. Which brings us to this question, you know, have these trends actually played out or even perhaps reversed? So one very good example that we have, and again, we're really open to more ideas on other possible um, um, uh, avenues where these trends may have actually played out or reversed, is medical advice on breastfeeding, for example. And I'll show you there, you know, it's really a case in which um, in, uh, early on in the 1970s, actually, breastfeeding rates were on a decline because women were actually shifting to infant formula. And now more recently, if anything, you know, people are suggesting the breast is best and, and you know, breastfeed until six months, one year, and if you can, keep, go, keep going on, right, essentially. Okay. So um, what this figure shows is at least on some specific dimensions at which we were able to collect data to look at how these trends may have played out over time. Okay. So the way to think about this is that, you know, if you just think narrowly about breastfeeding, you know, you might think, oh, but that really only affects costs in the first couple of years. So I think one way to think about these different uh, trends is that they are actually at different ages of, for example, of, of kids. Right? So breastfeeding is at the very early, early on, and then you have time spent with kids doing childcare activities, and that's sort of a broader range of time. 
And then you could also have things like what is the average cost of childcare, which again stretches on to, uh, until they're about you know, sort of, uh, teenagers. Now, what we see here, um, so the solid lines are basically the uh, weekly hours spent on childcare. And there, there have been a couple of uh, pretty influential studies that have shown actually that um, between 1970 and 1990, actually, um, the amount of time parents spend with their kids is pretty stable, if anything, somewhat declining. But taking off sometime in the 1990s, these have really shot up. And so these are activities that are specifically related, for example, to you know, doing uh, educational activities with your children or shuttling them even you know, from classes and, and from school. And those have actually gone up really strikingly, especially for educated women. Okay. Now, if you look, for example, at um, whether the percent that ever breastfed in the US and the UK, again, here you see at least in the UK that these rates have been growing over time. Now in the US, where we were able to map it to a much longer time series in the past, you see evidence where it used to be declining, increasing somewhat, declining again a bit, and then now on the steady trajectory upwards. Uh, if you look at more conventional measures of uh, childcare costs, those have also seemed to have been uh, increasing over time. So at least on these dimensions, it seems that employment costs have been rising over time, and in fact, if anything, if, if a woman was projecting based on her mother's experiences, for example, he or she would have a she would have a particularly difficult job because you know, some of these trends had in fact actually been declining. Okay. All right. Now another piece of evidence on rising motherhood costs is um, we could turn to some survey data that basically asks current mothers, again, uh, you know, based on their personal experience, do they think parenting today is harder than it was before? Okay, so not the question about whether you think it's harder than what you thought, but how does it feel like today relative, for example, to your mom? Again, there's you know, bias and all of this, and you know, perhaps people want to show that they're doing more than what their moms do. <laughs> but it's informative that you know, two-thirds of current mothers say that motherhood is harder today than when they were children. And on the specific question about child-rearing costs, right, about over 56% say that they are more involved in their children's life than when their mothers were in theirs. Um, now, this is actually somewhat consistent with some of these patterns, but beyond that, actually, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, for example, these days, that you know, in the past, for example, kids could be left at home or maybe in the car for five minutes without being caught. And you know, some of these are harder to quantify, but the idea was that you know, back in the day, actually leaving your kids and take the subway in New York City was actually possible to it's not. And so these are some of the other costs that could have been, 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 been involved here. Um, now, moving to the question that was actually asked, and I think this is a very important one that, um, to some extent, we wish we could do a bit more, which is that have employment costs of motherhood risen? So we focus a lot on the life dimension of work-life balance, right? So what's the work dimension here? And I know many people in this room are kind of actively involved in research on that front. Has, in fact, the employment cost risen because workplaces are becoming more hostile to mothers, right? Now, on the one hand, I think there is some evidence increasingly um, influenced, for example, by Claudia Golden's work that you know, in many workplaces, there is a rising return to very long and flexible hours. Now, that clearly is going to hurt mom. And beyond hurting mom is that within the household, it could also lead to concerns about pay equity. So, for example, it doesn't even have to be the case that mom's work has become harder, but if dad's work becomes harder and the returns to dad's work has increased a lot over time and someone has to stay at home, that in itself could actually lead to um, some of the effects that we see. Now, beyond that, one thing, so one thing that we can look at with the data is we could look, for example, at job satisfaction. Now again, here the data is a bit tricky because um, these questions are, again, only asked to women who still have jobs, right? So again, ideally you would have wanted to know if you didn't have a job, why you were pushed out of the job, but we don't have that. But if, it's instructive, if, it, if it is instructive at all, we do find that on a simple question like job satisfaction, if anything, women with a job, um, even after childbirth, actually report being just as happy, if not happy. Now, again, this could be selection bias, but it does suggest that a very simple model where employers are just discriminating, discriminating against mothers doesn't seem to be at play. Um, on the other hand, of course, women could have, could have adjusted, right? They could have moved to workplaces that were more sort of amenable towards working mothers, and that's why you don't see much uh, by way of job satisfaction, but there we actually we don't see much of that. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that when we do do a cut by family-friendly occupations, so these are defined as um, occupations with above or below the median in terms of um, the share of mothers as well as the share of women, we don't find much um, difference in terms of the mommy effect. So these, being in a family-friendly occupation doesn't seem to mitigate the employment effect, um, suggesting that you know, to some extent um, it seems to be observed in, in both groups as well. Um, so that's actually about as much as I can say about the work dimension. Um, 
I'd be curious on any ideas on how we could push this more. Um, but uh, I think, at least within this project, um, it could be on the work I mentioned, but we haven't actually found much sort of direct evidence on that front. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that one of the women who were uh, interviewed by Shane Kamala's gave this a sample size n equals to one. You know, she lists all the endless things she does with the kids, and then she says, then I go to work where I can rest. And I can personally actually kind of relate to that. Right? Um, anyone who says, you know, childcare is hard, you know, yeah, the work is hard, no, child gets harder sometimes. Okay, so I'm just going to end with a, a bit of concluding thoughts and um, maybe a couple of um, ideas for future work that we didn't address in this paper that would be really wonderful to address. So um, we argue in this paper that women are surpassing their mother's education levels while no longer surpassing their um, participation levels, largely because they don't anticipate the rising employment costs of motherhood. Uh, we show that women, especially educated ones, appear to be more surprised by how hard motherhood is, at least as shown in the change in attitudes as well as the retrospective uh, answers to some of these questions. Um, we also find, at least in the longer term, that no 18-year-old woman explicitly plans to be housewives despite planning to be mothers, um, and especially in light of evidence that suggests that actually a large fraction of them really do end up becoming uh, stay-at-home moms. But there are at least two related questions that we have not taken up in this project. Um, I think the first is that you know we've provided some very suggestive evidence that the cost of uh, motherhood have, have appeared to have risen, but very little sort of by way of understanding why is it that these employment costs have gone up. And in a sense, it's also a puzzle because if you think about it, you know, this is again the pre period of time where women are most prepared to enter the labor market. Why is it that during this precise period, you know, social norms, for example, have changed in a way that make it more difficult for women to do that? Um, one possibility could be you know changes in technology. Um, it could also be the case that you know motherhood itself has become more enjoyable. There's a greater opportunity because of working outside the home. Maybe one possibility is with rising inequality, more of them are married to husbands who can actually support that kind of lifestyle, and therefore women choose to do that. Um, have social norms actually become more traditional? Um, I didn't show you any figures there, but actually if you pull up the uh, sheet um, of gender norms uh, over time, um, it very much mirrors the employment pattern at least in the U.S. So you see a greater shift towards more liberal attitudes, but then again a plateau since the 1990s as well. Now we don't know if it's cognitive dissonance, but it does. there is suggestive evidence that even the shift towards more liberal norms seems to have also slowed in the 1990s, which is a bit of a puzzle. Um, I mentioned this very briefly, perhaps rising returns to long hours also penalizes equality within couples, right? Because um, there are lots of you know, gains to be maximized, and it might make a lot of sense for greater sense for greater specialization. Um, there has also been some work that has suggested, and again, no one has really shown this empirically, so I think it'll make for a really good paper, that rising inequality could itself raise the stakes of child rearing, right now that the returns are even higher. And there's also some speculation that you know there's a great increase in competition for top slots in college. Again, you know, making it sort of uh, there being a much higher return for moms than now, another question that kind of like, if you think about what the implications of this is for uh, understanding human capital accumulation is the question of, are we kind of saying that women are over-investing in education, given that they're not working? And I think here, uh, we want to just be really clear to say that um, we're not saying that, okay? And in fact, <laughs> and it would be really, you know, kind of bad if we were. Um, and in some sense, I think what, this research suggests that the fact that labor market returns appears to have slowed for women suggests that in order to really understand why is that women are um, investing a lot in education means that you, we have to also step away just from looking at the wage returns to education. So I think there is now some literature looking at the non-labor market returns to education, and I think that's where a lot of interesting work um, is going on. For example, marriage market returns could actually be higher for women than for men. Um, in terms of you know, spousal quality, the uh, quality of the marriage, as well as quality of children. And beyond that, uh, social returns could also be important, sort of the inter intergenerational returns in terms of health and education of the, of the next generation as well. Right, um, that's it. So we have just five minutes, but we could take a question or two. Or something, you should internalize the fact that you're probably not going to work. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think the only way we, one that we could look at that might be the very short run employment expectations. But I think again, for that, it's, it's going to be very difficult for us to focus on such a long period after childbirth. So, no, but you, you, you see the same lot of uh, like 10 years after childbirth. So eventually, right. you know, you should, your mistake should become becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah. So in the data, we, 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 we just actually haven't been able to test that, right? Because so the one that we could look at for short run and long expectations, that's using the BHPS. Yeah, yeah. And that we were only able to go up to about five to 10 years, five years after. So it would be interesting to know if at some point they, they self-correct and they just realize, or if, you know, every period they keep thinking they're going to return or, you know, um, and, and, and just keep getting it wrong. But, and yeah, we, yeah, we just haven't been able to that. So is the cost of raising a child increasing for men, for fathers as well, in the, in the last few years? Mm -hmm. Because if, if this is the case, right. then it's kind of like a real asymmetric because you don't see any employment impact for right. them, but still like they are spending more time with the children. So somehow, uh, I think this is, this is, a, this is a kind of a symmetry that, uh, right. uh, so why for women, like if yeah. the costs are increasing, but there is a, such a hard mm. So I think, that, okay, so with, uh, with time spent with kids, uh, I think fathers, educated fathers have also been spending a bit more time with their kids, but the increase has been way less dramatic okay. than that for women. So there is already that asymmetry. Now, the other thing also, and I think this sort of goes back into like, it would be really nice to look at more characteristics of the husband in some sense, and I wish we could do a lot more, but as you can see, you know, we were really down to sort of 600 observations, and you know, there's sort of a lot of cuts that we want to do. But I think beyond that, I mean, one thing that we didn't touch on is this idea that maybe it's not that women anticipate how hard parenthood is. Maybe they anticipate how difficult it is to, how much work their, their, their spouses are going to do, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Or, for example, how much comparative advantage is generated in the first few years of, 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 of childbirth. But we don't have that precise question, but I think, again, um, these are some of the, I mean, I think really understanding what, where husbands play in this is going to be really important. And I mean, to some extent, I fully acknowledge that point and we weren't able to do as much as we could. But I would say, by and large, in the literature, at least you know, in the US today, I mean, the gender division of labor within the household is still very, very pronounced. So, very often, if anything, if I did a cut, for example, by you know well, father's income, you would actually see that the larger employment effects are actually found among women who are married to more higher income spouses. Um, so the, while these are men who have more liberal attitudes, perhaps, it also is the case that I think there are other countervailing forces that make it such that when one person specializes and really earns very big returns, the other ones are just Maybe it's our education. Actually, so we'll, uh, I mean, I guess to, said it about now what happened with uh, I guess this, this is two minutes and it's sexual it's, harassment, the yeah. same thing. It's really bad to do a plug for a project you're currently working on, but so one of the things that we look at, at least in the Swedish data, it, is that you can actually look at, for example, kids who do extremely well, for example, when they're 13. Okay? So, so this is literally like the way I think about it. It's like if these are kids, imagine they're the top kids in the middle school, the top of the distribution. And one thing that you can map, and this is probably fairly obvious, is that the, the, transit, the probability of each of them making it to the top decile of their own gender-specific income distribution is the same and very high. But then, because of the gender gap in earnings, in fact, actually, these extremely highly talented with girls are going to be something like 20 percentage points less likely to be in the top decile relative to the boys in the same class. So sometimes it's the messaging, right? Because you know, based on something like that, um, maybe the, the messages we're sending is. Uh, um, the most encouraging thing I read recently was about a, a young uh, researcher who just had a baby, and she had been at conferences presenting for quite a while, and after the baby, she pushed to get her grant for attending the conference increased so she could take the baby and so she could take her husband. So this, this I thought was quite wonderful, and then when she got there, the hotel, there was no accommodation for, you know, pumping, right, for, for the breast milk part of it. So, you know, but, but that push, right, by a woman to say, these are my needs, right? I can participate if you meet my needs, rather than just taking all the costs on personally. Right. Yeah. That's a great example. I think Harvard actually has a policy like that, yeah, where you can apply for those types of grants. 
uh, please join me in thanking. Uh, <laughs>